We're in 2054. And the story I'm going to tell you is the story of why I ended up on Mars. So thank you, Change Now, for helping me with the visa to get here on back on planet Earth. Thank you. 2059. And also, thank you, Elon Musk, for the ride back. Really nice, really sweet. But before I start telling you about what happened, I'd really like to go back to where it started, back in 2015. Back in those days, for those of you in this room that remember or were born before 2015, you might remember we were very, very optimistic about technology. Cambridge Analytica hadn't happened. Trump was not elected yet. Um, Brexit either happened. But yet, we were very optimistic. And I was 27 and in London, hanging out with a lot of entrepreneurs that build the companies that now, uh, later on were big companies, like guys from TransferWise, CityMapper, and so on. And those of you who are familiar with the tech community and startup in Europe back those days, you might remember a chap called Mike Butcher, the editor of TechCrunch. He, he was leading the, he was uh, the editor and leader of this magazine in Europe, and he knew almost every entrepreneur and was hanging out with every of them to know what's the new idea out there. But on one of those nights, he tweeted something unusual, this. And I'm not going to post the picture to which he's relating to in this post. You will all remember this picture. The picture of a baby, 36 months old, face down, dead, on the shores of Europe. He's a refugee. That picture met the headlines. And this is the picture that got to this post and that got Mike to say, how can a technology sector that says we're changing the lives of people and making this world a better place, not really interacting with the people that need the most help right now and that are users of technology? And so Mike Butcher did this, as I said, we got a group of Facebook started. I joined in, 2,000 people joined in in 48 hours. And 10 days later, we were 300 people in London gathering entrepreneurs, technologists, refugees, wondering what can tech do to alleviate the suffering of people that are displaced. Not what tech can, how can tech solve the world, it's not the question, is how can we alleviate some of the suffering. So we started hacking, and it became viral. It went into 25 cities in nine months. We got to New York, Oslo, Krakow, Sydney, uh, Nairobi, and we went to the Balkans in Belgrade, and we got joined by more and more refugees. Now, it became a big creative mess that has its problems. And so Mike said, after nine months, we need to structure this because it's an organic movement that's volunteer-led, passionate, but it won't end up anywhere if we can't structure it. So please, Josephine, join me and become CEO of TechFugees and structure this. It was a big responsibility, big challenge. You have to move from an organization that's volunteer-led to become an impact-driven organization with its own processes. Not a small challenge. When I went to the tech investors, funders, and I said, we want to do technology with and for refugees, they said, oh, you're going to do charity, right? And I said, no. And then I went to the NGOs and they said, we want to build technology with refugees. And they said, oh, you want to replace us? And how are you going to use that data that of vulnerable people? How can this not harm those people? And so it's like, this is not what we're trying to do. So I went back to Har Hackers and asked, please help me to build this organization and structure it. And this is what we did. We got joined by Criteo, we got joined by big companies like Google, Cisco, but really the people that made that movement happen until the 2020s were the refugees and the geeks that were part of that community by donating to our, to our organization and by supporting it with everyday hacks. Now, 
2020 is a really important day for us because that's the year where change now happened. More people became aware that things need to change. And we got Greta Thunberg that got that message out there that we really need to quickly move on. And we're not dealing with a crisis here. We're dealing with a new reality of migration. Climate and migration is linked. And it will be, and it has been. So we were very optimistic. We saw a lot of growth thanks to all of these conferences, thanks to a lot of people joining our community. But at the same time, remember, Trump got reelected. And then more extreme right rose. And so from state level, nothing moved. Worse, investment levels into integration programs for refugees wiped out. So we were faced with a big dilemma. It's like, nothing is going to change if it doesn't happen at a big level. But that was before 2029. In 2029, in Europe, the Danube swelled, flooded, flooded all Europe. Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary flooded. Four million people displaced, Europeans this time. So we had to deal with relocating. People were forced to relocate, and for this time, they were Europeans. So what happened on that day is that consciousness came back again, as it did when the photo of that baby came on the headlines. Consciousness that we needed to do something and that it was the new normal, this flooding. Those flooded lands were not, uh, you were not able to live on it for the next five years. So we needed to integrate those people that had been relocated. Four million people, four times more than one million, but possible. And that's when we got lucky because we were there and had developed for the last 10 years those technologies. So the European Union called us, we got our first contract with states, and we got to be able to help all these Europeans. Facts, I'm getting out of the story right now, but this exists right now. And so the little fiction story here I'm saying is Integrate Hub helps people with their mobile phone, refugees, whatever the language is, to get into a new city and know what's available to them. And Tura Games helps kids that are out of school to access education, and here it's to learn languages by games on their mobile phone. It's open source and it's free. This helped all these four million people that got displaced in 2019. And we continued, and what I'm most proud of is the day the flooding happened, we were able to deliver at scale in Europe for every displaced European the possibility to have access to healthcare online and to be registered with a data the registry with their information that was safe and that they could manage the data. Now, while all of this was going on and we were really happy and I got invited to the UN Secretary General to speak about what we did for those four million people in Europe, awesome. A weird, dodgy kind of companies appeared, and we still, I still don't know, 20 years later, if it was from China, US, Russia, I don't know. Those guys were hackers, and they were serious about it. And what they did is they copied everything of our technology, but removed all of the ethical elements of it. So they started building technology that helped states manage, control, and get as much data possible about the people that were coming to those countries. So we got big surveillance technology coming on. As I was leading tech refugees and seeing the no growth of contracts from states, also they were cheaper, those guys. And they were really, their tagline was professionalism efficiency. The states loved it, got contracts, and every government really wanted to get those guys to help them monitor, do we want that migrant? Is he skilled? What's his credit scoring? Is he educated? Can we get him on a job? No? We can't, we can't have him. That was against our ethical standards at TechFugees, but yet we were losing the market. As I got more and more depressed about this, it was back in 2044 then, I called on Mike. I was almost 50, so kind of old and tired. And Mars did a good, do, good thing for me. And 
And then I called on Mike, the founder. He was 90-ish. And in a groggy voice, he said, Josephine, look, you wanted to build that big organization. You became too big. You structured it great, but you became very hierarchical, and you forgot one thing. An organization can't achieve change. It's people. So you need to go back to down to the roots and ask people to help you build something bigger. So what we did, and as he said, he said, do a hack. So we went back. We went back. I posted on Wikisocial that night, because Facebook was no longer a place you wanted to post things. And on Wikisocial, I said, who wants to help me build something that will keep us safe from surveillance and building digital walls? Out of all the ones, people we had in the technology community, we had 3,000 people showing up doing a hack. It took us nine months, but we worked nine months on this project called, oops, Ellis Island. We launched it on September the 9th of 2044. And what we did was a huge, giant hack. So basically, every system of every government on the world could no longer track back the credit soaring of migrants if they were mentally or physically armed, if they were good or bad payers, anything. Everybody was free to be able to go to a bank and get money. Everybody was able to fly again. And everybody was able to not be scored and have their rights and human rights respected. But that was a good hack. It worked. Not for me. I got all the mafias for all of these guys after us. So obviously what I did, as you would, is I found exile on Mars and went to get refuge there. Because, yeah, they were after me, me big time. Um, when I landed in Mars, what I realized is nothing was done for anyone who was new there. Nothing to welcome, no like app for whatever. So I said, hey, Elon, come on, let's build Mars Fugees. And so we built it. End of story. But anyway, ce que je voulais vous dire, et je vais le faire en français cette fois-ci, ce que je voulais vous dire, c'est trois choses, les messages que je voulais vous faire passer. La première chose, c'est qu'on ne peut pas être pour ou contre la migration. La migration, elle est, elle a été et elle sera. Il n'y a pas un mur qui va arrêter un tsunami ou qui va arrêter une énorme tempête. Il n'y en a pas un. Deuxième chose, la technologie n'est qu'un moyen. Elle n'est qu'un moyen et n'attendez vraiment pas la machine à éthique pour en créer. C'est nous, aujourd'hui, qui créons de l'éthique ou pas dans la technologie. Ce n'est pas une machine. Et la dernière chose, la dernière chose, c'est que j'aimerais que, pour revenir à la conférence Change Now, c'est qu'on n'attende pas que le Danube et des catastrophes climatiques en Europe nous déplacent, nous, Européens, pour qu'on s'en soucie. Et pour garder sur une note positive, je voudrais vous laisser sur deux choses. Le passé nous rappelle que l'histoire humaine, avec un grand H, elle commence avec une migrante africaine qui s'appelle Lucie. Que le présent nous explique que la technologie est le reflet de nous-mêmes. Alors, dans le futur et dès aujourd'hui, je nous souhaite, à nous tous, de rêver de beaucoup d'humanité. Merci beaucoup.